Today we're going to discuss comparative historical analysis, which is essentially incorporating historical research in the social sciences and particularly in political science. And one way of going about it or one way of structuring comparative historical analysis is through path dependency. That means you can get, you can have comparative historical analysis without path dependency, but path dependency is one particular way of doing so. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So historical research in political science essentially derives from historical research in history. We both use archival uh, research. We're both looking at primary sources. Uh, but there are some differences. Well, to begin with, political scientists engaged in historical research will say that nothing is unique. Uh, we're not digging into a particular case because of the case itself. It is not unique in and of its own. Um, related to that, we have a more general orientation. We're using historical analysis to help form an understanding of a general class of phenomenon. Um, we're not just interested in the French Revolution itself and becoming an expert on the French Revolution. We're using our insights that we're gaining from the French Revolution to come to a more general theory of revolutions. What does our knowledge of the French Revolution teach us about revolutions in general? Connected to that, uh, Historical research in political science tends to be theory-driven. We use theory to help guide what questions we're going to ask and what events to focus on. The hypotheses that were formed based on previous research on other cases are the hypotheses that guide us when we're looking at the evidence from this particular case. Now there's a trade-off. Political science uh, uh, research that is historical tends to have less uh, uh, um, tends not to be as rich in its detail as uh, research, archival research in the discipline of history. But we trade that off for a more focused causal analysis. Now the picture here uh, in the corner uh, is an interesting example of this. It could be interesting in and of itself. Um, this shows uh, King Nadia Shah and his son uh, Zahir Khan, who becomes Zahir Shah, somewhere between 1929 and 1933. Uh, we could learn more about that particular event, who was sitting with each other, what are the political and historical connections uh, with them. But it also tells a more general theoretical story, and that is the one I'm interested in here. One sees uh, people who are dressed in a modern way, but one also sees people who are dressed quite traditionally as well. In many ways, the Afghan state building project from 1929 onwards was an amalgam of tradition and modernity. And Nadia Shah, even though he grew up in India and was educated, exposed to Western-style education, was very much interested in pursuing uh, state building and consolidating power on the basis of traditional linkages. And so that theoretical story is also told in this uh, picture as well. What is path dependency and what is a path-dependent analysis? Well, to begin with, it's one form of process tracing you have a um, theoretical framework that outlines a causal process and you match it up with the evidence and you go step by step. But there's some um, uh, peculiarities with path dependency. Now, let me first, before I go into the details, outline, outline the main concepts. You have antecedent conditions, you have the critical juncture that is shaped by the antecedent conditions, but at the critical juncture, some crucial choices are made, or at least one crucial choice is made, as to what path to follow. When that choice has been made, you get what is called institutional reproduction forces that make um, a trajectory embarked on before that make it continue going in that direction, and then you've got a long-term outcome. So antecedent conditions, critical juncture, institutional reproduction, and the long-term outcome. So the most important element of the path-dependent process is the critical juncture. It's not the first, you've got antecedent conditions first, but I'll talk about that next. The most important and, one, and the defining aspect of path dependency is the critical juncture. So what is a critical juncture? Well, to begin with, it's a fairly short circumscribed period of time. Um, in this fairly short period of time, there are several choices available. Each of these choices, uh, at least two, maybe more, uh, should be plausible. They should be possible. They shouldn't be predetermined that one choice is picked. 
There should be several cho choices possible. However, each of the choices leads in a different direction. If they don't lead in the in this in a different direction, if they all lead in the same direction, it's not a critical juncture. There's not a juncture at all, just going in the same direction. A critical juncture has to be multiple uh, paths possible. Once you've embarked on a particular choice, however, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to return back to the original choice point. So this is what a critical juncture is. Let's make it practical. What does that mean? Well. I think the example of marriage, shadi, is very good here. Before marriage, there are many potential choices available. Um, maybe you or your family have um, uh, created a list of, of people that you're going to pick, and there may be a particular reason why you pick them. Maybe uh, because of love, maybe because of money, maybe because of um, a cultural, religious compatibility, life goals. There may be different reasons, but during a fairly short amount of time, that choice is made. And it's a critical choice. It's one of the most important ones uh, there are. Um, that will shape the rest of your life. There's really no uh, going back to that original choice point anymore. Now, if we uh, use an example from politics, let's look at the creation of Pakistan and the separation of the subcontinent. Before 1947, there are several choices available. Um, some people wanted to uh, have a united India with a fairly strong central government. Then there was the cabinet mission plan alternative, which would have kept India united, but a very decentralized India, where most of the power lay in the uh, regional uh, government. Um, India could have also gone the way of the European continent, where most countries are the, divided on the basis of language. Um, and that is a real possibility in India because you have regions that are clearly linguistically uh, uh, characterized by different uh, linguistic um, uh, backgrounds. Uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, India was separated uh, on the basis, on the logic of religious difference, uh, most importantly Hindu and Muslim. And so that was the choice that was made in the end for a number of particular reasons, but other choices were available. Uh, but once that choice was made, uh, there was no going back. Before we continue on with the next step of the path-dependent process, we have to take a quick look at the previous step that we skipped, antecedent conditions. I started with critical juncture because that's really the most important part of path dependency. But uh, we have to also talk about antecedent conditions. Antecedent conditions are essentially the context that helps create the choice menu available during the critical junctures. Um, however, um, in order for the critical juncture to be a critical juncture, these antecedent conditions can't predetermine what choice is going to be made. It helps shape the choice menu, but it doesn't determine which choice is going to be made. So if we use the example uh, of marriage, if we continue with that, uh, based on your religious, social, economic, cultural background, um, you or your parents or your family are going to um, look for a particular kind of person. You're not going to look for any old uh, candidate to, to be your um, future spouse. Uh, it's going to be um, circumscribed by uh, some antecedent conditions. But these antecedent conditions aren't actually going to be uh, the, the, the decisive factor in making the choice. They're just going to be those factors that help create the list of suitors available. Here I've copied a picture of a painting, the suitors of Penelope, uh, of um, it's essentially depicting um, a story from ancient Greek mythology. Now what comes after the critical juncture? This is where we get the term path dependency from, following a particular trajectory. Um, well, to begin with, you've got institutional reproduction. And there's two types. Uh, type one is that what we call self-reinforcing mechanisms. There are the, those forces that keep uh, you on a particular path, on a particular trajectory, even though there might actually be better or more efficient um, other paths available. But the self-reinforcing mechanisms, like those red arrows, keep you on that particular path. Now, there can be different types of self-reinforcing mechanisms. 
Some of it has to do with money, profit. Um, to continue on a particular path is cheaper than to switch to a different path. The cost of switching are too big. Particularly, the further along you go along that path, it becomes too expensive to move off of it. Secondly, tradition and habit might be the main causes for uh, having you stay on a particular path. Um, you or an institution or a group might have gotten used to the way things are. There might be a better way of doing it, but you've got used to this, this particular way, so you stick with it. There's simple institutional lag. You've got an institution that's uh, gotten used to new institutional procedures, um, new uh, way of organizing, and so changing it becomes too difficult. And lastly, power. Whenever you get a new setup in politics, you get a new set of power brokers that like the way things are, the new way, and they don't want to go back to the old way, way or change this new way because it's benefiting them. So these are self-reinforcing mechanisms that keep you on a particular pathway. Now, what are some examples for that? If we continue with a marriage example, um, we could say that at the critical juncture, you might have picked your spouse or your family picked your spouse for a variety of reasons, uh, maybe because of muhabbat, ishq, love, or maybe because of uh, family compatibility, um, maybe because of money. But why do you stay together? Well, there might be a completely different set of reasons why you stick together and not uh, separate as soon as the going gets tough. So you might have um, gotten married because of money, but then the self-reinforcing mechanism becomes love. You get to know each other. You come to appreciate each other. Or maybe it's children. Uh, you have children and that is the glue that keeps you together, even though that is not what brought you together in the first place. So the mechanisms that uh, draw you to a particular choice at the critical juncture are not the same thing. Uh, they're not the self-reinforcing mechanisms that keep you together after the choice point. Another example, famous example, is out of the keyboard, QWERTY. Why do we have this keyboard, this Q-W-E-R-T-Y keyboard? Well, there's a particular institution, there's a particular history to that. Um, but this QWERTY keyboard is not the best keyboard uh, um, in terms of hand posture, in terms of efficiency. But it was one of the earliest and most widely distributed ones. And even though people developed better ones that would be more efficient and better for your posture, and your health of your hands later on, it became too difficult, too expensive to um, train everybody to use a different keyboard. Uh, typewriters to, to uh, make a bunch of different uh, set of typewriters, too expensive. So increasing returns of the, the established way of doing things outweighed having a more uh, efficient uh, alternative. C similarly, if we continue with the example of Pakistan, um, and the, the creation of Pakistan, a lot of people expected Pakistan to disintegrate pretty quickly because it was bequeathed, um, it did not receive the same share of resources, the same the fair share of resources that India had, and some people believed that there wasn't really a logic for its existence, particularly on the Indian side. However, once it came into being, it persisted. It came into being because of one set of reasons, Jinnah, um, British colonial apparatus and so forth and so on. But the reason why it stayed together afterwards were different ones. Jinnah died very quickly. But you had institutions like the bureaucracy, like the military, uh, that um, protected Pakistan externally and created an internal ethos of patriotism um, that kept Pakistan uh, um, and uh, um, Pakistan continues to exist to this day. Now there's a second type of institutional reproduction, uh, type two. Uh, Mahoney also talks about that. That's a reactive sequence. So whereas self-reinforcing mechanisms are these forces that keep a trajectory on its pathway, even though better alternatives would be available, a reactive sequence has a very different logic. Think of a set of dominoes that go of one hitting the next, hitting the next, hitting the next, and hitting the next. Or a billiard table where if you hit the ball a particular way, it's going to ricochet against another ball and that's going to hit another ball. Um, and so the, the, the each step along the process is not logically connected 
to the previous steps. It's just sort of instigated by the previous step. You have a critical juncture as a trigger, as that person hitting the billiard ball. That will lead to consequence A, which will lead to consequence B, which will lead to consequence C, which will lead to consequence D, and that will lead to the outcome. And the outcome could not have been foreseen at the time of the critical juncture. That's a reactive sequence. Um, there's not one pathway that you're kept on. You're simply sort of being uh, shunted from one to the next. Uh, what would be a good example? Well, I think the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the emergence of Al-Qaeda uh, would be a good example of a reactive sequence. Now, nobody would have predicted that from the invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, the communist superpower, uh, you would get the, the emergence of a... Um, um, radical Islamist terrorist group in Al-Qaeda. The two don't seem to be logically connected. But there is a reactive sequence that connects them. So in 1979, you have the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. That's the first trigger, the critical juncture, the choice that the Soviet Politburo made. They could have made a different choice. Uh, um, archival data shows this. Um, there's the Mujahideen counter-mobilization supported by the U.S., by Pakistan, and the Arab Gulf states, even China. Um, You've got uh, the Pakistani government prefers those Mujahideen uh, groups that are more religious over against those that are more nationalist, Afghan nationalists. Um, you also get uh, young religious Arab men that are mobilized in Arab Gulf states, uh, many of them wealthy like Osama bin Laden, to come and fight jihad against the godless Soviets. So they come. Then you've got bin Laden meeting Abdullah Azam in uh, Peshawar, and um, this uh, proves to be a source of inspiration for him, and this is where Al-Qaeda is founded in Peshawar, the base, initially starting as a guest house and then um, uh, developing into an organization. Then you've got the end of the Afghan Jihad, the, the Soviets pull out, the Soviet Union disintegrates, you have the end of the bipolar system, you have the per per first Persian Gulf War that brings U.S. soldiers to Saudi Arabia on the invitation of the Saudi king to help kick out Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. And this is where Al-Qaeda, this fledgling organization that is very tiny, starts focusing on America as the enemy um, of the Ummah and the Islamic world. So it focuses on America and the Western countries. And this, of course, becomes a big uh, mobilization and rallying cry. And this is uh, how you get the emergence of Al-Qaeda. So this is an example of a reactive sequence. You could have never predicted that the initial trigger would end up in the consequence and the outcome that it did, but it does. Now when you read the Mahoney article, you realize that he talks about reactive sequences in a slightly different way. For him, a reactive sequence is not really a institutional reproduction type 2, but it's something that comes after institutional reproduction or is a reaction to institutional reproduction. It's a corrective to the new trajectory. So you get the antecedent conditions that shape the, the choices available at the critical juncture. At the critical juncture, one particular choice is made because of particular um, um, dynamics going on at that short uh, period of time. And then you get self-reinforcing mechanisms that keep uh, the trajectory going a particular way, but then there's internal resistance to the new course. There's a slight back and forth, there's an uh, uh, adjustment, a slight adjustment or a conflict um, that will slightly uh, change the trajectory and then make it go in, a, uh, in the direction of the long-term outcome, the trajectory that it is locked in. So this is how Mahoney talks about a reactive sequence. It's something that follows the self-reinforcing mechanism. It's not an alternative to the self-reinforcing mechanism. Okay, now it's your turn. This assignment is based on the reading by James Mahoney on Central American countries. Now, I've given you a table here, uh, along with all the elements of path dependency. I've given you the cases, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and I've matched each of them with the correct regime outcome. Costa Rica uh, becomes a liberal democracy by the mid 20th century. Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Nicaragua is a traditional dictatorship, as is Honduras. Guatemala and El Salvador um, become military authority have military authoritarian regimes by the mid 20th century. So that is correct. What is incorrect is the intervening steps that make up 
the path-dependent process. So the antecedent conditions, the critical juncture choice, the institutional reproduction processes, and the reactive sequence um, are not properly matched up with each case. So your job, based on the reading, um, is to match them up properly. So if you go to pages 116 to 129 of the reading, you'll be able to match them up properly. So there's the antecedent conditions. Um, what was the, the threats that the leaders of each country uh, perceived to be facing in the mid-19th century, uh, which um, that con consists, that, um, cre that is the antecedent condition. What are the um, choices available at the critical juncture? Which liberal policy choice was chosen, the radical or the reform one? Uh, what were the processes of um, the self-reinforcing mechanisms after the choice was made? How did liberalism develop? Did a polarized class structure and a powerful military develop? Um, or did you develop uh, um, an agrarian elite without this polarized strong difference between rich and poor and without a strong military? Or was there U.S. intervention? And lastly, the reactive sequence. And how far was there an attempt at democratization? And how far was it successful? So rearrange these properly according to uh, the reading.